awkward, but I gotta have you hook that on my pants. <laughs> I can't get it. <laughs> Thank you. I know, I'm like, I can't get that done. Okay, ladies, I'm going to get started. This is my favorite lesson that I share with you in the seminar, mostly because it's, it's the basis of our, our, our seminar. When we started talking about, we wanted to look at marriage through the eyes of our spouse and share that. Me share with you and Wayne share with the guys. Wayne is sharing with the men some of what I shared with you last night about what our role looks like. And, and his is a little manlier version, <laughs> but he's sharing that. Uh, so I kind of wanted to share with you, we sat down together and I said, I need you to write me a list of what does marriage look like for you? How do you see it? And so Wayne did that and I even questioned some godly men in my life. I, I questioned men of different age groups to see what does marriage look like to you? Because I wanted to know what, what men see when they are in a marriage. What does it look like? What does God's role that has been placed upon them when they say, I do? What does that look like? What does it feel like? So that's what I want to share with you for the next few minutes. I want to look at marriage because that's kind of what we want to be doing. Marriage, we, we tend to make it very self-centered and that's not God's plan. That's not God's plan. We are supposed to be self-sacrificing like Wayne was talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, so I have some quotes that I'll stop and read throughout this lesson and share with you from, from Wayne and from some different guys. But when I asked Wayne, he described it like this. He said, when I was a boy, I'd put my small feet into my father's shoes and try to walk around in them. You know, we see kids do that all the time, little kids. He said, it wasn't easy. However, it wasn't until I was married that I understood that it took more than bigger feet to fill a husband's shoes. And they, we do that. Little kids want to be grown-ups. They want to do that. And I, I remember being a young girl and being a teenager and can't, uh, thinking, I can't wait till I'm grown up. And then you get grown up and have all those real life responsibilities on your shoulders. And so that's what Wayne, uh, that was his first description of what marriage looked like. So what we're going to do, we're going to start out back at the beginning on the wedding day. We're gonna start there at the front of the group that has gathered to watch you take your vows. And here is the groom standing up there and he's standing up there probably in those shiny rented dress shoes that you had him wear for the wedding. <laughs> there he is standing up there. He's waiting for his, uh, his bride to appear. It makes me think of, I have four sons. Uh, my family is a goofy family. We are loud and obnoxious and we think we are so funny. So we'd have these weddings, they'd have us sequestered away in some room somewhere and we would be cutting up big time laughing and everything. And then that cue, either the music or somebody would come into the room and go, okay, it's time. And I can remember watching my sons and the, the look that would come over, the color would drain out of their body. And, you know, it, the moment changed completely with, okay, it, it's time, you know, it's time. And he would walk out there and walk to the front of the auditorium. And I can just see my boys standing there. In fact, let me encourage you, watch the groom. Watch the groom's face. You can always turn and look at the bride, you know, after the doors swing open. But I always watch the groom. And even those big old macho tough guys missed over when the doors swing open and, and the bride steps into view. It's, it's just a, a very emotional moment for a, for a man. They're standing there waiting and watching and everything is pretend and there's his princess. There's the one he's going to spend the rest of his life with. 
It's just all pretend. And they go into the, go into the rehearsal then after making all of those wonderful vows and, and the rehearsal and all of that is pretend. It's, it's make believe. And you go in then to the honeymoon if you get to do that. And you, you have all of that. And, and life is just wonderful because it's just the two of you. We love each other so much and it's just so beautiful and so awesome. And then, well, Wayne and I, Wayne and I got married on a Friday night in my parents' home. I, I didn't share as much with you last night as I normally do. I'm a really cheap person. I, it just is who I am. It, it's a flaw. <laughs> it's not a strong characteristic. I think it's a flaw. But my dad had said, I'll give you this much money for your wedding, and what you don't spend on your wedding, you can have. And I went, oh. <laughs> so we got married in my parents' home. <laughs> But, and it was very personal. I loved my wedding. Very personal. I did have a dress. It was beautiful. Um, so we got married in my parents' home in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Friday night, we spent the night in the Williams Plaza Hotel. And then on Saturday, we got in a moving van and moved to Denver. Because I had told Wayne, yeah, I'll move to Denver if you can make enough money where I can stay home. And he did. <laughs> it wasn't a lot of money, but I got to stay home with our kids. Um, so we, anyway, we took off and moved on Saturday, we spent the night in Wichita on Saturday night, went to church in Salina on Sunday morning, and then moved on into Denver, and spent that first week with his parents, and we were looking for an apartment, and moved into an apartment by the end of the week, and it was pretend. I mean, we were playing. We were having so much fun. Look, this is our house, you know, and it was just this little bitty apartment, but we loved it. We loved it. We were having so much fun. And Wayne says then that first Monday that he woke up to go to work, he kind of rolled over in bed and looked at me and went, what have I done? <laughs> he said, it wasn't that I didn't love you. It wasn't that I, I didn't regret the decision I had made. He said, but real life came raining down on me in that moment. He said, I feel like I went from the shiny rented dress shoes to those steel-toed heavy work boots <laughs> in those two words of I do. <laughs> he said it was just crazy. In fact, he worded it. He said, um, I went from spectator to quarterback, from passenger to driver from patient to doctor, from a dependent to the provider, in one quick I do. And I know our life changes too when we say I do, but, but in the next few minutes, we're going to look at marriage through the eyes of our spouse. And so as I share this with you, please don't be making a list of things for your husband. Okay, this is what Tammy says you've been doing, and this is where you're short. <laughs> That's not what we want to be doing. I want to share these with you so that when we look at our husbands, we look at them in a different way. And then we can lift them up. We're wanting to be an encourager in our marriage. That's who God intends for us to be in our marriage. So that's what I want to do. I want us to look at marriage. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to Ephesians 5, and I realized I left my good reading glasses at the hotel, and so I have these broken ones, so we're going to wing this. Um, I'm going to read, starting in verse 23, and I'm going to read through the rest of the chapter. Okay. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought, and that word ought means must or moral obligation. Um, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought, again must, also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. So we see here, when, and when Paul is writing this letter to the church at Ephesus, they've had some questions about marriage, or maybe some struggles he's seen in their marriages, and he wants to paint a picture for them of how beautiful marriage is, and he's actually talking about, he says in verse 32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. He says, I want to give you an example of marriage because you should understand that to explain Christ and the church. So that's how beautiful our marriage is supposed to be. And so he talks about the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And that's the example he's using. So we see here in verse 24, um, no, let me see where I'm at. In verse, yeah, 23, the glasses thing is gonna throw me off. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. So when I look at this and I'm applying this to the church, that's my Jesus. Jesus is the savior of the body. That means everything to me. And it should to you, because we know we're lost without Jesus. He is the savior of the body. But this says the husband is the savior of the body as Christ is the savior of the body. So your husband takes on this spiritual responsibility in his marriage. That means everything. That's what God has said, okay, now this is your role. This is what I want you to do. And so all of us have husbands from different backgrounds. Your husband may not even be a Christian. He may not even be a Christian. He may not have been raised in a Christian home. He may be a Christian now, but not raised in a Christian home. And he's not real clear on what a godly husband is. And he's been asked to be that. And so it is a huge role. And we must learn to be patient with our husbands as they take on this role. But it's huge. So he's taken on this spiritual leader role. And we need to understand that that's pretty huge. That's pretty uh, heavy on their shoulders and be patient and encourage them as they go along this journey. And then we see in verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. He gave himself up for her. You know, I told you last night, it's, you, you know so much when you look back in your marriage. Uh, when Wayne and I were dating, he had this car. It was his baby. Uh, I don't know the name of the car. He, he's told me many times, but it was this brown car with two doors and it was just his treasure. And I can remember him when we were dating, he would wash that car once a week. He would clean that car out, every little gadget that would come out, steering wheel covers, whatever. He was buying something for that car. Um, he would do, some of you younger people don't understand this, but he'd take this tub of stuff and he'd wipe it on the car each week and buff it off. It's called waxing. You drive through a machine and do that now or have somebody else do it for you. But he would do that. Once a week, in fact, we'd, we'd go out on a date and if we'd get fries, he'd go, well, now watch it, watch it, be careful with that. I think I saw you drop some salt, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> now, overprotective of this baby. And when we, when we moved to Denver, we had to tow the car because he didn't want to put the miles on this baby. So that was his treasure. And then I can, I can remember when I look back as, as we start into our marriage, he didn't have the time for that car anymore. And I remember seeing that car sitting out there dirty and thinking, ah, yeah, he should wash that car. <laughs> and, and I can remember he quit buying all the little gadgets. He didn't have the time or the money for that, that baby anymore. He was laying himself aside. That wasn't his focus anymore. His, he had said, I do, and so now his focus had changed. And he was having to lay aside some things financially and with his time and different, different things. And, and again, if your husband isn't doing that for you, be patient with him. <coughs> be patient with him. He may not know. He may not know, but that's part of their role and they will start laying aside some of the things in their life for us because God has asked them to. 
And then we go on and see in verse 26, he says, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. <coughs> holy and blameless. And I've written in my margin, am I holy and blameless? And so he's talking to our husbands here, and he says, and you're going to sanctify her. And you're going to keep her without spot or wrinkle. You're going to keep her holy and blameless. And I think about Wayne. Here's me. Uh, here's Wayne. He's the head. And here's me, the body. And I told you I have a, a rebellious, strong, <laughs> independent spirit. And so Wayne has been commanded to keep me holy and blameless. And I'm here, this little spastic thing on the bottom going, I got this. Come over here. I got this. You know. I got this. I'm strong. I'm super Christian. I've got this. And Wayne's going, wait, wait, wait. And don't you, I feel like Jesus is that way sometimes with the church a lot. Jesus going, I said, follow me. And we're going, now, and now if you do it this way, it'd be so much better. And Jesus going, follow me. And we do that in our marriages. And so our husbands have been called to sanctify us and keep us holy and blameless. That's huge in my marriage for my husband. Because again, I'm, I'm independent and I've been told to put myself under and not be so independent. But that's part of his role. And when, then we go down, I love verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. I've got it underlined and highlighted in my Bible. And I think back to the early years of our marriage when I first started reading that and when we were newlyweds and looking at that and going, oh, look. Look, I love that. It sounds so romantic to me. You're going to nourish and cherish me. Look, look at this, Wayne. You're going to nourish. Hey, did you see this? I don't think you're doing this. And I, I can remember reading through this and crying, going, he's not nourishing and cherishing me. He's not meeting my needs. I can remember being so hurt. But if you look at this, you go back up to 28, it says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So our husband is going to, supposed to be nourishing and cherishing us, just like he does his own body. I don't know about you, but my body speaks to me. <laughs> when I'm tired, I know I'm tired. When I'm uh, thirsty, I, I'm at a new hormonal stage of my life where I dehydrate so easy. That's one of the reasons I passed out. Wayne was sharing that story. I, I dehydrate really easy, so I know I need to just dump the water into my system, and that's why I spend half my time in the bathroom. So that's part of my body. I know when I need water. I know when I'm hungry. My, I am a tummy growler. My stomach growls loud. I had a little girl sit with me, I she was three or four, in church one time. And we we're sitting there and they passed the communion around. And I don't know why that little bitty bit of cracker and that little bitty sip of juice makes my stomach go, more, more. <laughs> Just starts growling, more. And it's so loud. And this little girl looks up to me, my stomach's doing that. She goes, oh, was that a yayin? And I went, it's not a lion. I am hungry, <laughs> you know, and I'm getting the mints, like that's going to make my stomach quit growling. But my body speaks to me. And so my husband has been told to take care of me, meet my needs, without me speaking to him. And I think as women, we tend to do that, well, if he loved me, he would know what my needs are. <laughs> if he really knew me, he would know what I need. And they're standing there, male, female, they're going, I don't know. I just, I don't know what your needs are. And the world is telling them, Wayne shared that joke last night about flowers and chocolate <laughs> and jewelry. The world is telling them those things. And, and Wayne was bringing me flowers when we first married. And I finally had to tell him, for me, and I didn't tell him this, but for me, flowers are like, look, there's our love dying on the table for 50 bucks. <laughs> You spent 50 bucks for that. And I'm like, oh. And I, I eventually had to share with him, that's not my thing. That's just not who I am. I don't ever turn down chocolate, ever. 
Uh, and I'm cheap jewelry. Don't spend, don't spend a lot of money because I'm going to lose it. So cheap jewelry is my thing. Um, the year he bought me a shark steam mop for Valentine's Day, good year. That was a good year. <laughs> but I had, I had to start communicating with him and telling him, these are my needs because the world is saying one thing and the world is, sh is filling them up with things and they're standing going, I, I want to meet your needs. I want to nourish and cherish you and we need to tell them how. We need to learn to tell them in loving ways who you are, what, what hits your buttons, what makes you feel loved, what makes you feel nourished and cherished. And we need to do that in a loving way, not in the way that I started out in the beginning. You're not nourishing and cherishing me. Don't you even know me? But finding a way to go, okay, you really want to hit my button? You want to make me happy? You buy a shark steam mop, that's a good day. But we have to learn to communicate with them and share. And this changes. This changes as you go through the path of marriage, as, you're, as you go through the different phases of marriage. Because I like flowers now. I want them in a pot of dirt. I'm going to kill that too, but I want them in a pot of dirt to begin with. I feel better about that. And then we go and we see in verse 31, uh, for, for this cause, a man shall leave the father, his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You can read commentary after commentary about, about what this means, but if you look at it in context right here, husband is the head, the wife is the body, one flesh. That's all it means. So we want to be making sure we're building marriages and communicating with our husband in a way that that one flesh part is, is happening, is, is being created, and that we're not trying to separate it all the time, but that we're building that one flesh, that one person, that one body. And so our husband has been called to do that for us. He takes on that huge spiritual responsibility in, in his life when he says, I do. And then when our husband says, I do, he becomes our protector. Um, we go back to Adam and Eve in the beginning, and Adam and Eve had been in the garden. God had been watching over them. They had no worries whatsoever. God had been their protector. They didn't, they weren't, didn't have to be afraid of anything. And then they sinned. And then in Genesis chapter 3, God starts giving them the consequences of that sin. And God turns to Eve and he tells her, yet your desire shall be for your husband. And again, commentaries go off on what all that can mean, and it does have a lot of deeper meaning. But here we've had Eve. Eve has taken charge and has caused this sin, though I always say he was right there, he should have spoke up. <laughs> but Eve, was, Eve caused this sin, she was the leader into this sin, and so part of her consequences are, God says, and you're going to want to do that, that's who you're going to want to be, but your husband is in charge your husband is going to be the one now that is going to be your protector. He's going to be the one taking care of you now. Um, when I think of Wayne, here's Wayne, me, Spaz. Um, I, in my personality, I'm not really afraid of anything. I used to be afraid of spiders. Um, they usually, I have a scar on my hand. I was bitten by a brown recluse, so I had this really deep fear of spiders. They creeped me out. I screamed like a big girl. I, I was really afraid of them. Then I had five kids, and the first four were boys. And I'm watching my boys, and I'm going, uh-oh, i got to conquer this. <laughs> and so I, I'm not afraid of spiders anymore because my 35-year-old was screaming like a girl every time he saw a spider, and he still does. So I had to fix that for the other ones. Um, but I had to overcome that. I, I talked to anyone. We would go downtown Denver, and we'd be walking, and, and I, I have a heart for the homeless. Everybody has a story, so I'm drawn into that. And I would talk to people, and so Wayne was going, be careful, be careful, he's coming along behind me, be careful, be careful. <clears throat> I also have this sarcastic tongue in my mouth. Um, we'd go to dinner, and we'd be sitting there, and I'd watch a couple, and I'd watch a guy treating his date just horribly. And it would come out of my mouth, oh, <coughs> you must care for her so much to treat her like that. <laughs> you know, and Wayne's eyes are doing this, oh. <laughs> yeah. And I've said it to women, too. Oh, man, he must be really strong for you to be able to talk to him like that. You know, Wayne's going, oh, 
oh. And he's always just protecting me, trying to protect me. He was wanting to be my knight in shining armor. And it didn't hit me how much he was wanting to do that for me because I was going, oh, relax, I got this. I can talk my way out of the bag kind of thing, you know. I was thinking I was all protecting myself. Well, we lived in a, an apartment one time in a bad area of town. I loved the apartment. I had no complaints, but it was not a gr great area of town. And the woman above us, uh, was not married and had a little boy that was four or five. Uh, Quincy was his name. And she would live with different men at different times. And the man she was living with at this point, I could hear them arguing. And I do not judge vocal arguing. Wayne and I are both very vocal. I don't judge that. I didn't care about that. But I could hear crashing around and I could hear Quincy crying. And Wayne is distracted. I don't remember why. There was somebody else there. He was totally distracted. And I'm giving him that eyeball. You can do something about this. You're... So I finally, I went upstairs and I knocked on the door. And I said, I, the guy answered the door all angry. And I said, I just wanted you to know, I can hear you. I'm worried about Quincy. And if it doesn't stop, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I went downstairs and I went back. And when I went back into the apartment, Wayne goes, what have you done? What ha Tammy, you're going to get me beat up. <laughs> he says, or not something much worse. He says, but you've got to quit doing this. You've got to quit being that person. I want to protect you. And you keep throwing me out in front of the bus. He says, you've got to stop it. You've got to stop it. And I hadn't thought about it until that point in my life that here he was trying to be that hero for me. And I would just kept shoving them aside and going, no, 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 I don't need you for that. And he's going, but you don't understand. It's my role. It's my role. So we need to understand they're trying to protect us, but they're also trying to protect us in the way, in a holy manner. We just looked at that they're to keep us without spot or without wrinkle and keep us holy and blameless. So you may have heard your husband at one time say to you, uh, they announced it church the other day that ladies class is starting back up. I know it's a topic that you would be interested in. I think you might like that. And you're like, why would I want to go to ladies class? All they do is gossip in there. Who wants to go do that? And your husband's thinking, holy and blameless. I'm, I'm, I want you, I'm trying to keep you holy and blameless. Or it may be the other thing. Uh, They've announced the ladies' retreat. I'll keep the kids, or why don't you go? You're an older woman. You'd be such a good influence on those younger women. And you're thinking, if I'm going away without the kids, I'm not sleeping in a bunk bed. <laughs> if you're an older woman, why would I sleep in a bunk bed? <laughs> and your husband's thinking, holy and blameless. I need to do this for you. I want to find a way to keep you holy and blameless. And I think so often, as Christian women, we think, well, I've, I've got this. I can do this. Uh, I have a friend that she's going to save the world, and I was doing that with her. She was going to save her neighborhood. And uh, she was started doing a Bible study in her home. And after a while, her husband said, I'm a little concerned about this. And she's going, what do you mean you're concerned about this? I'm saving the world <laughs> kind of thing. And he said, I'm seeing changes in you I don't like. He said, I think you need to be careful here. Instead of influencing them, they're influencing you. And she was mad until she came to talk to me. And when we started talking about it, she said, oh, he's trying to keep me holy and blameless. And I wouldn't let him. And I went, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Now, we know we're responsible for our own souls. We, as individuals, are responsible for our own souls. But I believe firmly from this that our husband on the day of judgment will stand before the Father and say, God will ask him, did you do everything you could for her to keep her holy and blameless? Did you? And I, that's huge. That's a lot of responsibility that our godly men have taken on. So we need to remember that. They become our protector. And then the next thing, stay with me when I say this. When we say, I, when the husband says I do, he becomes the provider. Now, don't shut me out. Don't shut me out. I want to give a, a basis here. We go back to Adam and Eve in the beginning. 
And uh, God now turns, he's turned to Eve, and, and then he turns to Adam, and he says, by the sweat of your face, are you going to eat? Because they've been in the garden. They've been plucking food and pulling it out of the ground, and it, life was easy. Life was easy. He says, now by the sweat of your face, will you eat? And then we know in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. Now, I know we live in a world where it's hard to get by. Most of us work outside the home. Most of us do to eat. I get that. I understand that. Um, we live in a world that has put this material bubble around us that has made life really difficult. And I think especially in the United States, we're so blessed in some ways, but in other ways we've got this huge pressure on us. And so our husbands have been put in this role of provider, but most of them can't do it on their own. Most of them can't do that. We had a, a young family over one night and I was in the kitchen fixing supper and they have a handful of kids. And the wife was off with a child, and the man was there, and I wasn't really paying attention to him, but I was visiting with him. And they just made a transition in their life where the uh, wife had gone part-time, and uh, most of the kids were in school, but the, the younger one was being watched by a family member. And I thought this was all working out. They were this, such a godly couple. They were so active in the church, loved this couple to death. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is all working out so great. Their plan is just moving so well. And so I was doing whatever I was doing, and I did, hadn't, wasn't even looking at him, and I said, oh, how's that going? How's life going with that new ch transition you're going through? Is that going well for you? Didn't even look at him, but I hear, <sighs> and I kind of turned, and his face had just fallen. And I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, and I went, what's going on? And he says, oh, Miss Tammy. He says, between you and me, I'm really feeling guilty. And I went, oh, guilty? What are you feeling guilty about? And he said, well, this isn't the picture I had in my head for my family. This isn't what I wanted. <coughs> he said, I, I, I thought I would be the, the provider and my wife could stay home with the kids and we would have that family. And he says, we can't do it. They have astronomically huge school loans that they're paying back to Christian colleges. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> and it's, it's just overwhelming for them. So they're trying to get that all paid off. And I, I start lifting him up. Your wife loves her job. She's doing so good. She's a teacher. She's working with children. I know. She never complains, he says. He says, but it's not the picture I wanted for my family. And I don't know if we think about that in our lives with our husband. Even if you're working because you want to, because it's what you want to do, he's still been called to be the provider. And we need to kind of wrap our heads around that in a way that we can lift them up. Um, living in the material world that we live in, usually the female is the person that sets the material tone in the home. I know there are exceptions. My husband is the shopper. <laughs> That's who he is. But usually the woman is that person. And we are the one going, you know, do we really, really need to stay stuck in this two-bedroom apartment? Do we, I, I, we need to buy a house because the world is going, well, everybody should own a home. We need to buy a house. When are we going to buy a house? We have to buy a house. We're supposed to buy a house. Oh, our car's dying and they, every day, neighbor's got a new car. We need a new car. What are we going to do, honey? Oh, this is horrible. All the kids need new shoes. All of these things raining down on our husbands in, on the, in the world telling us you have to have all of these things. You have to have all of these things. And if you read in 1 Timothy, we know, maybe 2 Timothy, um, we know that we are to be content with food and covering. And if I teach that to little children, they get it. I'll say, what is food? Oh, it's macaroni and cheese. It's pizza. <laughs> they throw in candy and I try to... I, I let it go. But then, then what is covering my clothes, my house, my blankie? They get it. But we get caught up in, we need more stuff. But I need more stuff. 
Oh, we've only had this, we've had this couch forever. We've had this couch forever, we need a new couch. And your husband's going, the couch is fine. But we start thinking that way and start thinking we need more and more and more and more stuff. And so we put this pressure on our husbands and on ourselves, if we're working, put this pressure to have more and more stuff. And if you look, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we read these verses in there often when we do uh, the collection and talking about a cheerful giver. And if you read in there, verse 8 talks about we are given everything for every good deed. And then you read down in verse 11, that's in um, 1 Corinthians, I got going and skipped way over that. Uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 9, verse 8, and then down in 11, it says, uh, you are given so that you can give liberally. Your stuff has been given to you, blessed, you have been blessed with it to share with others. And so that's what you need to be doing with your stuff. And so often we gather our stuff in our home and most often nobody ever even sees our stuff because we're not having anybody in because we don't have time because we're working to gather stuff. So we need to be very careful. I'll get off that soapbox. And we need to be very careful about that. Our husband is the provider. And so when the young man shared that with me, I went to Wayne and I said, I need to know more about this provider thing. <laughs> I need to know. And he goes, you don't want to know. I said, no, I, I need to know. How do you feel about this, Wayne? How? He said, well, Tam, he says, you know, all those years, we go to the parade of homes in Denver and it's those multi-million dollar homes, loved it. And in my head, I'm playing, I'm pretending. I'm walking through those houses going, oh, look. Oh, I could make that. Everybody do that, you know, take a picture. I'm gonna make that someday. <laughs> Never made anything. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. Or I walk through and I go, oh, we could have our whole family in here for Christmas. We could do that. Or we could have everybody from church and we do the buffet over here. And I just, I'd pretend. He said, you remember when we would do that and you'd say those things? He said, in my head and I think, and you can't provide this for me. And we go through the mall. I wear a lot of black and white. And so we go through the mall and I'd see an outfit in a window and I'd go, oh, look, that's a Tammy outfit. And Wayne would, he says, and I think, and I can't buy that for you. And I'm going, oh, honey, I, I never thought of that. And he goes, I know. And he said, and, and you're not ever being malicious, but we say things like that, and that's what our husbands are thinking. Or if you are working outside the home, and you hate your job, and you do the, oh, man, I hate my job. I wish I didn't have to go to work today. And your husband's going, oh, if I could make more money, she wouldn't have to. And we, we live in a world that it's hard to do that. So remember, he has been called to be the provider. And most often we help in those times. Just be careful that you're, you're lifting him up and not weighing that further down on him, but encouraging him in that way. Make sure, because what we're wanting to be doing is we're wanting to be, I call it helping them into converse. But I'll, I'll admit these are the worst shoes I've ever worn in my life. <laughs> They're just flat. So Wayne and I have both put inserts into our shoes. I have the little gel things going on. He's got some other kind going on. But that's what we want to be doing for our husbands. Life is hard. And I want to be the kind of godly wife that is that gel insert in his shoe, that is lifting up him up, that is encouraging him. We need to remember our husbands love us. I think we forget that sometimes. I think we get caught up in day-to-day -day living and we think, well, if he loved me, we'd do something different. They love you so much. They're really wanting to be pleasing to you. And if they're godly men, they're really wanting to be pleasing to God. Life just gets really hard. And we need to remember that. Remember how much they love you. Remember this responsibility that they're carrying. I talked to a young man. He was young to me. He's in his mid-30s. He said, I said, okay, I, need, I want some quotes for this marriage thing. He said, I said, how does marriage look uh, for you, feel for you? And he went, oh, wow. <laughs> he goes, if I don't work, I feel like we don't eat. If I don't protect, my whole family's in danger. 
If I don't lead, then we're all lost. So much rests on me. They're all counting on me. I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a lot our men are carrying. And we need to remember, they're going to make mistakes. We do. We all make mistakes. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. Wayne remembers everything. I can barely remember Wayne's name. <laughs> that's just our different personalities. Wayne is a debater. If we get an argument, that's why he's become a preacher. Every argument has three points. <laughs> like, that's who he is. I get it. I know who he is. But he remembers those kinds of things. But we need to be working on being people like God. Scripture tells us that God not only forgives, but he forgets our sins. And I love that. I think we tend to think that we're going to stand there on Judgment Day and God's going to have this list that rolls out kind of like Santa's naughty list and read off. He's going to read, remember when you did this? Remember when you did that? And that is not how it works. Not in Christ. Because the blood of Christ removes those sins. And as long as we are repented and, and we have asked for forgiveness, He has no list. They're gone. He's forgotten them. And that's who we need to be for our husbands. We need to be women that are remembering to not just forgive, to, but to forget. And I think that's hard for us, especially if your husband has made a financial decision early in your marriage and the consequences of that kind of carried through your whole marriage. Financial decisions can do that. And he gets further down the road and he's wanting to make another huge financial decision and you go, oh yeah, well, have you thought it through? Remember, remember last time? And he's going, you think I forgot? And sometimes we draw to the surface those things thinking we're lifting them up and they're going, thanks, I needed that. And we need to make sure we're letting those go. We don't want them laying our mistakes at our feet. We don't want them doing that. We need to learn to be more patient with them and realize uh, that they are, will make mistakes and that we need to put those things aside. And then we need to remember that when we're going through hard things in our lives, when we're struggling uh, with things, our husbands will be going through hard things too. Uh, we have gone through with our five children, my bookend babies are what I call them, my oldest and my youngest, uh, have made some decisions and, and pulled them away from the Lord. They're not faithful. And it's been hard and it hurts. The three in the middle are doing great. <laughs> the two on the edge are, are struggling. And one night I'd gone to take my bath and I was in the tub and I don't know who else does this, but I was in there and I was doing the <laughs> cry thing. I could do the old ugly cry because nobody's looking. So I was doing that cry thing. And Wayne came bounding into the room to show me something. And he went, hey, are you okay? Did somebody die? What's going on? And I'm, I'm talking, <laughs> and I said, I, it's just the kids. I'm just kind of thinking through things. And he, oh, as long as you're okay, go ahead, cry. You know, he did that and he left. And um, a few weeks later, I had gone down early from my bath into the living room. And Wayne was sitting on the couch crying. And he never does that. And he was, <laughs> and I did the same thing he did. <gasps> Everything okay? Does somebody call? Somebody die? I'm like, you don't cry. What is going on? And he goes, Tam, I'm hurting too. I'm hurting too. And, and we forget that. Because when we go through hard things, it's like, would you just hold me a minute? Would you just help me through this? And they do. But they hurt too. They hurt too, and we need to remember and make sure that we're not just going here, just hold everything and, and make sure we're lifting them up as well and, and, and encouraging them in those times and especially in those family times or, or financial times. Remember, all of these hard times in a man's life, he's going to take that responsibility on his shoulders and think, what could I have done better? What could I have done different? So we need to remember in those hard times that they're, they're really struggling to, they're striving to be godly men. Wayne says he lays his head down every night, especially when the kids were, were younger and they started going off to college. And, and then you think toddlers are hard. You young mothers, you buckle up. <laughs> I, I long for the days when I could just go, I said, no, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm still trying that, and it doesn't work as good anymore. But he says he'd lay his head down at night, and he'd think, did I say too much today? Wayne's a controller. I let him. I let him think he's in control anyway. He, he, that's who he is. And did I say too much? Did I say too little? Did I do too much? Did I do too little today? Did I do enough for her today? Did I show her that I loved her today? That's who they're trying to be, ladies. They want to be pleasing, not just to us. They want to be pleasing to God. And if your husband isn't in Christ, be patient. Be patient. Your influence can help him change. But know, even if he's outside of Christ, that's still who he's trying to be. He's still trying to be all of those things for you. So be there for him. We want to be women. I, I so often try to be a woman that says, here, let me in those shoes with you. Here, I got this. Let me get it. Let me get in there with you. Or I'm doing this the whole time. I'm kicking rocks in going, let's see how you can walk with that in your shoe. <laughs> and we don't want to be that. We want to be that insert in his shoes. We want to be lifting them up. We want to be encouraging them. So will you, will you pray with me? We're going to pray for our husbands. Father, I thank you so much for this day. And Father, we thank you for our husbands. We thank you for the fact that you have blessed us with men that are in our lives, that are, are, are trying to be who they're supposed to be. And we know, Father, that that can be overwhelming for them. So many of them don't even know how. Lord, I pray that you, you keep their hearts soft so that they can look to others to see how to be pleasing to you. We pray that you keep their hearts soft so that they stay in your word, so that they have that plan and that guide for their lives. Father, we just, we just pray that you strengthen each one of them. The world is so hard, and we pray that you lift them up and help them realize they don't belong here. They don't belong here. And help us be wives that, that help them on that journey. Wives that are, are trying to be encouragers and not just make life hard. I pray, Father, that you forgive us when we, when we do make those mistakes. You know who we are better than we, are. we know ourselves, Lord. So I pray that you just be patient with us and, and help us to see the flaws that we have and those things that we need to move out of our lives so that we can be better encouragers for our husband. But, but I do, I just pray, Father, that you lift these men up, that they are men that are pleasing to you and that will bring glory to you. And if there's any here in this group today that are outside of you, Father, I just pray that you keep, keep pulling on them and help us keep uh, encouraging them in your direction, Lord, so that they can also be in Christ and be glorifying to you, Father. We thank you so much for all that you do for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies.